Today we're going to be talking about how to use U substitution and then integration by parts to evaluate an integral. And in this particular case, we've been given the definite integral of theta cubed times cosine of theta squared d theta. And we'll be evaluating that on the limits of integration square root of pi over 2 to square root of pi. I've gone ahead and written the integration by parts formula over here on the right because we're going to need that in a little bit. But this problem asks us to make a substitution first and then use integration by parts once we've simplified the function that's inside of our integral. So we need to identify the substitution that we're going to make in this function. And it should be at least a place to start with that you try to substitute for theta squared because having theta squared inside of our trigonometric cosine function here means that we could have a little bit of trouble with this. We want to simplify what's inside our trigonometric function as much as we can. So let's make a substitution for theta squared and see where that gets us. In this case, normally I would use u as the variable for substitution because it's u substitution most commonly. But we're going to need to have u available to us later for our integration by parts formula. So let's actually go ahead and use like x substitution and, and make a substitution for x in terms of theta instead of u so that we don't get confused later. So we'll call x theta squared. And that will be the substitution that we're going to make. Remember that when you're dealing with u substitution, you then take the derivative of what you just identified as x here, and we'll call that dx. So dx will be 2 theta. And then, of course, we add to this d theta. And now we want to solve for d theta. We'll divide both sides by 2 theta, and we'll get d theta is equal to dx over 2 theta. So now we can plug these values back into our integral. So we'll end up with the integral with these limits of integration. And essentially what we have here is we have theta cubed, and then we have cosine. Remember, we substituted x for theta squared. So now we just have cosine of x. And d theta, we know, is dx divided by 2 theta. The first thing we need to realize here is that we can cancel a theta from the numerator and denominator. So we'll go ahead and cancel out theta here. This will leave us with just theta squared in the numerator. So we can go ahead and call this here theta squared instead. But remember that theta squared we set equal to x. So instead of theta squared here, what we'll actually have is just x. And keep in mind that we have this, this 1 half here, the 2 in the denominator, that we can move outside of the integral. So what we end up with before we start our integration by parts piece, we move the 1 half out in front of the integral. So we have 1 half, our limits of integration. And then what we're left with is just x cosine of x dx. And now we're in a great position to start integration by parts because we have two components inside of our integral. We have x and we have cosine of x. So we need to identify u and dv. Well, in this case, it's really obvious what you should pick for u because remember, we want to pick something for u that will become simpler when we take its derivative, du. And the derivative of x is just 1, which is much simpler than x. So if we set u equal to x, that means that dv has to be everything else inside of our integral. So dv automatically becomes everything else, which is cosine x dx. So cosine x dx. Now we take the derivative of u to get du. So du is equal to the derivative of x is just 1. So we would have 1 dx, which is just dx. And then we take the integral of dv to get v. So we get v equals the integral of cosine is sine. So we get sine of x. And now we have all four of our components. We can plug these into our integration by parts formula. So remember our integration by parts formula. Essentially, we're going to be replacing this integral here, this entire piece, with what we plug in to the right hand side of our integration by parts formula over here. So we still need to include this 1 half that's out in front. So we'll get 1 half. And then we'll multiply this by the right hand side of our formula, which is u times v minus the integral of v times du. And we have those components here. So we just plug in u and v. u is x and v is sine of x. So u times v is just x 
sine of x, and then we subtract the integral, and again, we're just following here our integration by parts formula, v and du. So we have v as sine of x and du as dx, so we're just left with sine of x dx. And remember that because we're dealing with a definite integral here, we have these limits of integration. These limits of integration apply to everything inside these parentheses here, these big brackets. So we have to remember both this integral here and the x sine x. So we have to remember to evaluate at the square root of pi over 2 to the square root of pi. Now, thanks to integration by parts, we have an integral that's really manageable. We just have the integral of sine of x. Well, we know that the integral of sine of x is negative cosine of x. So what we end up with here is 1 half times x sine of x. And because we're going to get minus and then negative cosine of x, that'll be plus cosine of x. And that is our integral evaluated and of course we have our limits of integration here that we'll have to uh, evaluate this, this function at. But before we do that, now that we've finished taking the integral of everything, we have no integrals left, we need to go ahead and back substitute for x. Remember we said that x was equal to theta squared. Well now that all our integrals are gone, it's time to put x back in terms of theta. So what we'll have is 1 half times theta squared times sine of theta squared plus cosine of theta squared. And now we want to evaluate on these limits of integration. And we'll be plugging these limits of integration in for theta. Remember, when you're evaluating at limits of integration like this, you always plug in this top number first and then subtract whatever you get when you plug in the bottom number. So we'll plug in the top number, which is square root of pi, first. And what we'll get is the square root of pi squared. Well, a square root squared takes away that square root. So the square root of pi squared is just pi. So we end up with pi times sine of theta squared. And again, the square root of pi squared is just pi. So we end up with sine of pi plus cosine, obviously, of pi again. And then we'll subtract whatever we get when we plug in the lower limit of integration. So we need a parenthesis here so that this negative sign applies to everything we've got in here. So we'll get the square root of pi over 2 squared, which will just give us, of course, pi over 2. And then we'll have sine of pi over 2 plus cosine of pi over 2. So now we just evaluate. We have 1 half times sine of pi right here. Sine of pi is 0. So 0 times pi will obviously just give us still 0. This is going to go away completely. Cosine of pi is negative 1. So we've got a negative 1 there. Then we have here minus. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. So 1 times pi over 2 is pi over 2. And then cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So we just have a minus 0. We don't need to account for that. So we just have negative 1 minus pi over 2. Now, if we distribute the 1 half, we'll get negative 1 half minus pi over 4. And that's it. That's our final answer. So I hope you found that video helpful. If you did, like this video down below and subscribe to be notified of future videos.